So if you're visiting with us today uh, or just tuning in, howdy, um, we are at the business end of the book of Revelation. So if you haven't been here for the first seven weeks, you may think, wow, what a week to come and visit. Uh, We're in Revelation, that's the spooky one. Uh, And we're near the end, so that's going to be the spooky end of the spooky book. Hopefully, hopefully so far throughout this this book, we've been able to demonstrate for the people who have been here, this is not a spooky book. This is a, firstly, a letter written to a bunch of churches in the time of writing. And so because it's a letter... We know it's meant to be understood because it is what's called apocalyptic literature. We know it's meant to be understood in a particular sense, part poetry, part metaphor, uh, part prophetic. And today we'll get to some of the prophetic aspects of this letter. But we've been calling it the letter of revealing Jesus because apocalyptic literature literally means to unveil or reveal something. And so we're looking at how does this letter reveal Jesus? That's the goal of this letter is to reveal Jesus, to reveal the world as it is, to reveal who we are in Jesus and to understand things from his perspective. That's what this letter is doing. And so we've spent the last seven weeks, hopefully dismantling a little bit of the spooky approach, uh, a little bit of the fearful approach Uh, hopefully a lot, of the fearful approach, of the, well, this is all about future events and it's unknowable, or this is uniquely about our time today in a way that it hasn't been for the last 1,900 years. Hopefully we've dismantled a few of those things and we've been able to read this letter as a letter written to a group of churches in the first century, but also for us in Adelaide in 2022. That we've seen different aspects, windows, pictures, signs throughout the letter of revealing Jesus that have shown us the reality of the world as it is even today. That there have been things in the world for 2,000 years and even hearkening back to creation, hearkening back to the Old Testament, hearkening back to the time of Isaiah, to the time of Jeremiah, to the time of uh, Ezekiel, to the time of Job, um, to the time of David. Well, what else? To the time of the Exodus we saw last week. And as we see in Revelation, things that are telling us about the word as it is today, we're hearing echoes of creation, echoes of the Exodus, echoes of the exile, echoes of Jesus' time, echoes of the time in which this letter was written under Roman occupation. And we'll see that again today. But then we'll also hopefully even see foreshadowing of things that we've seen over the last 1950 years since this letter was written. And I say 1950, I don't mean exactly. I'm talking like a range. Uh, Let's just call it like 1900-ish years ago when this letter was written. We've seen echoes of the things we read in the book, in our time at least, since that time as well. Foreshadowing from the time of writing, but from our perspective, echoes from the time of writing. And we see things we've we read in this letter about our time today, about some of the persecution going on in our time today, some of the pestilence going on in our time today, some of the war going on in our time today. And we have seen and will continue to see some aspects of the future reality when God comes, when Jesus returns and makes all things new again. And so what we're dealing with in the letter of revealing Jesus primarily is revealing Jesus and the reality of the world as it is right now and has been since his ascension and will be until his return. It's important that we kind of set the stage again because when we come to things today, we're going to be dealing with, again, some well-known themes in the church and in pop culture. And what we don't want to do is to take what we've learnt from pop culture and apply it to our theology the rather we want to see what is the letter of revealing Jesus, revealing about Jesus, and how will we apply that to our lives? How does that sound? Okay. The last couple of weeks we have been, in fact, all throughout this letter, we've been looking at contrasts. If you hear a bird and you think, what is that bird? That's one of the displays that's still going, just in case you're wondering. Uh, We've looked at contrasts, the people of God, people of the world. We've been looking at, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the Holy Trinity and this 
unholy trinity. We've got the Father, Son, and the Spirit on the one hand, and we have the devil or the dragon and two beasts on the other hand. And we saw how um, the devil tries to set himself up as the deceiver. He's setting himself up as a counterfeit father. And he raises up a counterfeit son in the beast who has a counterfeit resurrection, counterfeit miracles, and a counterfeit second beast that points to the supremacy of the first beast and wants the world to worship the first beast, a poor echo of the true triune God, whose number is 777, completion and perfection, and the beast, whose number is 666, never, forever, never attaining perfection or completion. Today, this week, we're also going to have a contrast. There are two women being contrast, contrasted and two cities being contrasted. We're going to read a decent chunk of Scripture today uh, in, by way of setting it up. Um, but uh, the, the application today is hopefully much shorter than in previous weeks. So don't, don't freak out when we start reading a lot of Scripture and you think, oh my goodness, it's going to take ages to unpack. It's... There's only a couple of things happening uh, in these scriptures, very, very important things, things we've already visited in the past, and here is yet another window into the reality of the world as it is now and some of the things that are yet to come. So the two women we have are the prostitute and the bride, the two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem. So let's have a read, then we'll get stuck into it. This is from Revelation 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me. Remember the seven bowls from last week? This judgment that was being poured out onto the enemies of God. The final kind of judgment. No repentance, no coming back from this. Echoing the plagues of the Exodus, at which time there was also no repentance. One of those angels comes and speaks to John. Come, I will show you the judgment of the notorious prostitute who is seated on many waters. The kings of the earth committed sexual immorality with her, and those who live on the earth became drunk on the wine of her sexual immorality. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, you will recognize some of these themes. And those who live on the earth became drunk on the wine of her sexual immorality. Then he carried me away in the spirit to a wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, jewels, and pearls. She had a golden cup in her hand filled with everything detestable and with the impurities of her prostitution. I mean, this is hard. This is hard words, right? This is plain speaking. She had a golden cup in her hand with everything detestable and with the impurities of her prostitution. On her forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of prostitutes and of the detestable things of the earth. Then I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then, an angel, then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I'll explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast. So in case you're wondering, what does this mean? And there's been great speculation about what this means. The angel's about to tell us, which is awesome, right? I'll explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns that carries her. The beast you saw was and is not and is about to come up from the abyss and go to destruction. So again, if you remember the unholy trinity, this counterfeit resurrection, you're thinking, oh, this is, this is that same beast. Here's the counterfeit resurrection we're talking about. Those who live on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast that was, is not, and is to come. This calls for a mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet to come, uh, has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain for only a little while. The beast that was and is not and is itself the eighth king. But it belongs to the seven and is going to destruction. I know what you're thinking. What? We'll unpack it. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they will receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will conquer them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Those who are with him are called chosen, are called chosen and faithful. He said to me, 
The waters you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples, multitudes, and uh, languages and nations. The ten horns you saw and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked, devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to carry out his plan by having one purpose and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And, and the woman you saw is the great city that is royal power over the kings of the earth. After this, I saw another angel with great authority coming down from heaven, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. He called out in a mighty voice, It has fallen! Babylon the Great has fallen. She has become a home for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, and a haunt for every unclean and despicable beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. The kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown wealthy from her sensuality and excesses. Then I heard another voice from heaven, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins or receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Pay her back the way she also paid, and double it according to her works. In the cup in which she mixed, mix a double portion for her. As much as she glorified herself and indulged her sensual and excessive ways, give her that much torment and grief. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am not a widow, and I will never see grief. For this reason, her plagues will come in just one day. Death and grief and famine, she will be burned up with fire because the, word, the Lord God who judges her is mighty. The kings of the earth who have committed sexual immorality and shared a sensual and excessive ways will weep and mourn over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They'll stand from far off in torment, saying, Woe, woe to the great city, Babylon the mighty city, for in a single hour your judgment has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargo any longer. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet, all kinds of fragrant woods, wood products, objects of ivory, objects of expensive wood, brass, iron and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour and grain, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages and slaves, human lives. The fruit you craved has left you. All your splendid and glamorous things are gone. They will never find them again. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe the great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, jewels and pearls, for in a single hour such fabulous wealth was destroyed. And every shipmaster, seafarer, sailors, all who do business by sea stood far off, as they watched the smoke from her burning and kept crying out, Who was like the great city? They threw dust on their heads and kept crying out, weeping and mourning, Woe, woe the great city. Where are all those who have ships on the sea? Uh, Where all those who have ships on the sea became rich from her wealth, for in a single hour she was destroyed. Rejoice over her, heaven, and you saints, apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced on her the judgment she has passed on you. Then a mighty angel picked up a stone, like a millstone, a large millstone, and threw it into the sea, saying, In this way, Babylon, the great city, will be thrown down violently and never be found again. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, trumpeters will never be heard in her again. No craftsman of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a mill will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never be seen in you again. And the voice of a groom and bride will never be heard in you again. All this will happen because your merchants were the nobility of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. In her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all those slaughtered on the earth. So it's pretty pretty tough, pretty rough. What we're seeing and hearing, uh, you, you will recognize from previous weeks. It's another picture. This is not, again, Revelation this letter of revealing Jesus is not a chronological sequence of events that are going to happen sometime in the future. There are, these are different windows, different perspectives on the same events, the reality of the world as it is now, and some future events. It's a recapitulation of all of the prior events that have happened as well. And so let's have a look at uh, this window into this element, because you'll hear, oh, hang on a second, I thought last week we saw the final destruction of Babylon. How come there's the final, like it's done, it's finished, she's fallen. And then this week again, all of a sudden Babylon's back. What 
is going on. Again, not linear, not sequential, not purely looking at future events. We are looking at the reality of the world, even as it is now. There are significant warnings and calls to us today in these chapters. And there is a prophetic look, a prophecy, a promise of what's going to happen in the future, which is also a warning for us. So let's have a look at the prostitute. One of the seven angels with the seven bowls comes and speaks with John, tells him about the prostitute. So over the last 16 chapters, sometimes John hears something and then he sees. Sometimes he sees something and then someone explains it to him. Here again, we're back to he hears the angel tell him something and then he sees it. He hears about the prostitute from the angel. The kings of the earth committed sexual immorality with her and those who live on the earth became drunk on the wine of her sexual immorality. That's what he hears. Then the angel takes him to this wilderness, so he's out in the middle of nowhere, and he sees another vision. Now remember, these visions are symbols. They are signs. So what we're not reading Revelation to see is, okay, we we need to look out. There's somewhere in the world there's going to be a wilderness with a literal red dragon with a literal prostitute writing on it. We're not looking for that. We're looking at a sign that points to something. This woman on the beast, at first she looks enticing. In fact, we know she has enticed multitudes. People, lowly people, even kings, royalty, nobility, have all been swayed because she looks alluring. She has signs of wealth, gold and jewels. She's dressed in purple and scarlet. She has pearls. She's, she even has her own golden cup. The angel has golden bowls. She has her own little golden cup as well. And in this cup is not the wrath of God, but it is everything detestable. It's what she carries around with her. That's what she's dispensing. Everything that is anti-God is what this prostitute has. And she's not... <clears throat> She's not uh, totally with it. She's actually drunk. She's had so much. She's so intoxicated with the blood of the saints and those who belong to Jesus that she's drunk. This is the picture that John has of this woman. She has killed so many Christians that it's like she's drunk so much wine that she's actually become intoxicated. She's riding on a beast. And the beast you recognize from this these beasts we've read about in Revelation already. Um, you, you know, you see uh, seven heads and ten horns, and you think, oh, this is, sounds like this is how Satan was described, actually. And his first beast was described similarly. Satan, like a red dragon. Here we have a red beast. Same number of horns and heads. And this prostitute, on, like carried by the beast, is seated or situated on many waters. And the angel tells John that these waters are peoples, multitudes, multitudes, nations, and languages. All of the world is enamored with this woman. All of them have been taken in by her. All of them have drunk from her cup detestable things, things that are anti-God, things that are against God and against his people. That is the picture we're seeing here. And there's a sign of the woman telling us who who the woman is. She's a representation of Babylon, with whom, the verse tells us, the kings of the earth committed sexual immorality and those who live on the earth became drunk on the wine of her sexual immorality. So John is using the metaphor of sexual relationships, setting her up as a prostitute. Again, we're not looking for a, some future prostitute. He's saying that Babylon, this great city Babylon, is like a prostitute and all of the people of the world, small and large, insignificant and consequential, have all joined themselves to her. They haven't joined themselves in union with Jesus. They have joined themselves in union with Babylon. That is what John, or John is trying to help us understand, this vision is trying to show. And the beast, seven heads, ten horns, full of blasphemies. The angel tells us about that as well. It refers to seven mountains, very clearly saying This is Rome. We've already seen this in previous weeks. And just a recapitulation on the recapitulation where he's saying, you know, Babylon, uh, we we said um, Egypt 
was Babylon in the Exodus. Babylon was Babylon in the exile. And now Rome is Babylon. It's not saying that there's going to be a literal Babylon is going to rise up again. Uh, but there are these human institutions set against God over and over and over through history that are figuratively Babylon. Again, there's the illusion, a illusion, not illusion, a illusion to the counterfeit resurrection we spoke of a few weeks ago. And the beast carries Babylon. The beast doesn't love Babylon. The beast, the beast doesn't like Babylon. The beast is not there for the benefit of the woman. The beast isn't there for the benefit of the multitudes. The beast doesn't care about any of them. The scripture tells us the beast only uses these human institutions set up against God in order to wage war against God and his people. This is key to understanding these two and a bit chapters, Revelation 17 to 19.10. The beast doesn't care about the woman. We'll see in a little bit. At the demise of the woman, the beast celebrates. So first, it looks like the beast and the woman are in cahoots, and they are. The beast, is, you might look at it and go, oh, she's riding the beast, so she's in control of the beast. She's like, you know, riding it like a dragon. Uh, but no, 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 no. The beast is the one using her to deceive the nations. God loves those who do his will. Loves them. Scripture tells us. The counterfeit trinity only uses people to do his will and then discards them and celebrates the downfall when they're done. We see these contrasts. The prostitute in this passage, Babylon, again, Egypt, Babylon, uh, Rome, representing the human institution set up against God. And like we saw last week, they are being carried along by the beast. When human institutions, even nations, set themselves up against God, they become beastly. And we see this even in our world today. But not uniquely in our day today. We see this in various places around the world today. We've seen this most places around the world throughout most of the last 1900 years since this was written. It's not unique to our time. Again, remembering our war isn't against flesh and blood. We might look at the city and go, the city is set against us. Remember, the city is subject to the beast. And in this passage, we see the end of the great city. Another angel comes, declares the judgment upon her. She is destroyed in a day, even in an hour. So again, like last week uh, and the week before, we know we're not looking at some future chronological, here's an age of this and an age of this and, and many years of that. Uh, in a day, immediately, this judgment comes upon Babylon. Those who joined her, grief. Those who suffered at her hands because of their faithfulness to Jesus rejoice. And they're called out of the city so that they don't receive judgment. Just like in Abraham and Lot's day, they are called out of the city before the city receives judgment. Again, we hear these echoes and see these echoes throughout Scripture and throughout history. And then Babylon receives the measure of its own wrath against God and his people back on themselves. This is what Scripture says. Then I heard another voice from heaven, Come out of her, my people, so they will not share in her sins or receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven. God has remembered her crimes. Pay her back the way she also paid and double it according to her works. In the cups in which she mixed, mix a double portion for her. As much as she glorified herself and indulged her sensual and excessive ways, give her that much torment and grief. We saw this last week, another angle of this same judgment, saying in, because she has poured, because she has spilled out the blood of the saints, she will choke on the blood of the saints. It's gory. And it's supposed to elicit in us a, some revulsion. It's supposed to. Make us look at her and go, we are not allured by the world. That's the very reason this is in Scripture. This is what this passage is revealing to us about the world as it is today. It shows us the end so that today we aren't allured. We aren't drawn in. We don't join ourselves to figurative Babylon or literally the world and the human institutions set up against God. The judgment comes quickly. The plagues will come in just one day. Death and grief and famine should be burned up with fire. 
because the Lord God who judges her is mighty. So saying, well, God, remember to the churches to whom this was originally written, that they are suffering under figurative Babylon, literal Rome. The suffering. Remember some of these places, some of these churches are the ones that are being covered in oil and lit on fire to be candles for people on the way to entertainment. That's what's happening to Christians in this day. And Jesus is revealing to them, remember, even in the midst of your suffering, that everything that's coming on you will be doubly so on those who are doing it to you. The, the, the injustice of today is not a permanent, eternal injustice. God is mighty, and God who judges her is mighty. And then we see another picture. Now we see the contrast. Those who belong to Jesus, worshipping him in victory. This is what it says in uh, chapter 18. After this, or 19, uh, after this, I heard something like the cloud, sorry, like the loud voice of a vast multitude in heaven. So all of a sudden he's hearing the multitude of the saints. We've seen this picture a bunch of times already in Revelation to remind the people not only are the people who are causing their injustice going to face God's judgment and justice, but that's not the end of our story. It's not death at the hands of Babylon. There is something beyond Babylon and our suffering in these present times. What's the vast multitude in heaven saying? Hallelujah. Salvation. Glory and power belong to our God. He will save us. He is glorious and he is powerful to do the things that he sets out to do. You can have complete trust in God because his judgments are true and righteous, because he has judged the notorious prostitute who corrupted the earth with her sexual immorality and he has avenged the blood of his servants that was on her hands. A second time I said, hallelujah, her smoke ascends forever and ever. It's not saying that she's going to, she's literally burning forever and ever, but that her smoke is going up. The judgment of God is just and final. Then we see again the 24 elders and the four living creatures. Then the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. A voice from the throne came, saying, Praise our God all his servants and the ones who fear him, both small and great. Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. So here we have, we've met the first woman, the first city. Here's the contrast, the second woman, the second city. The second woman is a bride. It's Jerusalem. We'll be introduced even further in a couple of chapters to the bride Jerusalem, but we will get a taste of her here. Let us be glad, rejoice, give him glory because the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the lamb He also said to me, these words of God are true. The first woman, the first city, the second woman, the second city. John is making, or the giver of this vision, God, is showing us the differences between a prostitute and a bride. Both can look really alluring. Both can be very attractive. Both can be dressed in a way that denotes power or prestige or wealth. I said, but but only one of them is joined to God. The other is joined to the beast and suffers the same judgment as the beast. The bride is clothed in splendor, just like the prostitute, but a different kind of splendor. Her righteous works adorn her. She's not dressed in the trappings of wealth to try to look more alluring. She is intrinsically alluring because of her righteous works. The bride has prepared herself. 
looked at this last week. I mean, the bride also does have jewels. We see this in Revelation 21. The bride is the dwelling place of God. We'll see this again in a couple of weeks. The bride is a city representative of the people of God. And while this is one of the reasons, again, that John uses, or that the, <clears throat> the vision um, that John writes down uses a prostitute and a bride to give us the contrast, both and, and even sexual immorality. It's not just talking about sexual immorality. This is not about sex. It's using sex as the uh, metaphor for union, for joining. This is even echoes way back even in the creation story. For this reason, a man will leave his family and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. The two will be united. This is one of the reasons that Christians have a Christian ethic of sexuality. Not because we are prudes, not because we're trying to um, stop people from having fun, not because we're trying to stop people from like, you know, living out their true identities or any of those kinds of things, because we are a prophetic people and with our lives we are echoing the same things we are seeing in Scripture, the same echoes from creation about a man and a woman being united together. This would be a, an act of union. So that right at the end of the Bible, we see again a picture of this union, one an unholy union that ends in destruction, the other a glorious holy union that ends with Jesus and his bride being united forever. That's the picture we echo with our, with our marriages. This is one of the reasons that we get married as Christians. And we... we only have sex in marriage. It's one of the reasons we do this, because we are prophetically foreshadowing this great day and echoing the, the creation. We're, we're putting on display this. We believe what God says to be true about everything in the world. And one of the great truths is the groom is coming back for his bride. And so when we reserve sex for marriage, we are putting on display, we're, we're kind of foreshadowing and, and echoing into the world, Jesus is coming back for his bride. The two become one flesh. We don't want to be joined to the world in that kind of way. I'm no longer talking about sex. We don't want to be joined to the world in the world's ways. We want to be joined to Jesus he has made us his bride. And blokes, don't be bashful about being the bride of Christ. It is the most wonderful, wonderful thing. Again, this is the, re the reason we have marriage. God has given us marriage so we will understand the relationship we will have with Jesus. It's wonderful. It's amazing. It's beautiful. The beast discards those who are no longer useful to him and celebrates their downfall. Jesus loves his bride and unites with her. And the two become one forever. And what God has brought together, let no man separate and nobody can separate. This, is an, this should be an amazingly encouraging piece of scripture to us. Not one that causes us fear about some beast and dragon and, and woman in the future or you know future battles. We've seen the battle of Armageddon already. How did that go down? There's no battle. It's a sickle. It's a whisper. It's a sword coming from Jesus' mouth. It's over. It's done on a day, done on an hour. All of the plagues, all of the judgment, everything that we read that seems to take so long, uh, bam, it's done in a minute, in an instant. And then John is told to write, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. He's already been told, blessed are you when you hear these words. So even just today, we are blessed already. I'm blessed for reading them, Revelation tells us. We're all blessed for hearing them, which is awesome. And you are all blessed because you've been invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. You've been invited to this day. So what's the warning of these couple of chapters? Again, it's another look of the end of Babylon. 
a warning. Don't be joined to Babylon. Come out of her. Don't be allured. Don't be attracted. If you, if you ever find yourself attracted, remember the sign uh, paints the attractive city as a prostitute who will be crushed. And the prostitute's been riding on the beast and the beast does not care about the future of the woman. The woman's leading to destruction. All who join to her will join in the destruction, including the beast who doesn't care about her, is just raging against God. We need to have this unveiled, revealed to us so that we can fight against that attraction. And then remember who we are. Actually, we are the bride. Jesus is the groom. He's coming back for his bride. Be united to Christ. You're invited to the great wedding feast. Jesus wins. He doesn't win with a great battle. He doesn't win by having some great victory to, to overcome, a great enemy to somehow figure out how he's going to destroy. He speaks and the, with the sword from his mouth. It's done. This is one of the reasons uh, God has put us in community with one another, so that we can help each other. We need to be doing lives with each other, living those lives laid bare, so that we can communicate, we can um, confess, uh, we can uh, include people in our lives so that when we are tempted to go and be joined to Babylon, joined to the prostitute, uh, our family, our brothers and sisters can say, uh, don't do that. That path leads to destruction. People will say that to us, but also we need to love people enough to say to them, hey, this path you're on, now we, we know the end. We know where that goes. Come out of that city and come and be the city of God. Come and be the bride for whom Jesus is coming back and who is sealed with his seal. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you for these words, for your scriptures. Thank you that you've invited us to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Not just the feast, but you've made us his bride, made us his people united us to him, sealed us with your spirit. You're so good to us, God. And, and uh, we just want to acknowledge um, your goodness and your, your majesty. Can't wait for that day when we stand around your throne and give you glory with all the saints and all the hosts of heaven. But also, Father, help us to um, foreshadow that day, even with our own singing together now and with the worship of how we live our lives. Please help us, Lord. Help us to have the right perspective of who you are, the right perspective of the one on the throne, the right perspective of the one on the beast and her end. Father, help us to be bold in living lives laid bare so that others can speak into our lives and bold in our love for others so we would humbly but lovingly speak into others' lives as well. We want to be there on that day, joining with the saints. Uh, so help us live in light of that day every day. In Jesus' name, amen.